Independent Project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margo, and this is a true crime podcast where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. All right, so many of you really like it when I cover serial killers, and I get a ton of serial killer recommendations all the time because if you didn't realize this, there are many serial killers who either killed before during or after their military enlistments. But the ones that catch my eye are the ones that are less covered in the media. And today's serial killer is one I had never even heard of before it was recommended by various listeners. But for his low body count, he reminds me a lot of BTK, Dennis Rader. This serial killer was an airman who enjoyed volunteering in his community, specifically with the Boy Scouts, and was even lauded by the mayor as a role model. But turns out that deep down lurked a dark side that few people had seen. And when you think of a serial killer, you think of a big brawny shadow that lurks in the dark, not some scrawny looking teenager. Yet, here we are. Join me today as I discuss John Jubert's reign of terror in Maine, and then near Offutt Air Force Base, Nebraska. Now, let's dig in. This story was researched and written by one of our very own listeners and fan club members, Myrtle. Thank you so much for digging into this crazy story and bringing this case to my listeners. My resources for this episode include a book by FBI profilers Robert Ressler and Tom Shackman titled Whoever Fights Monsters, My 20 Years Hunting Serial Killers for the FBI, a 1999 Forensic Files episode titled The Ties That Bind, an article by Katherine Ramsland, a renowned forensic psychologist, and articles found in the Talk Murder to Me blog and the New York Daily News. John Joseph Jubert was born on July 2, 1963, in Lawrence, Massachusetts, to parents Joseph, who was a cook and a waiter, and Beverly, who was a bookkeeper. He had a sister, Jane, who was born two years after him in 1965. While Joseph and Beverly were working, the kids had a babysitter. But John eventually took to hating both his mother and his babysitter. He hated them believing they had a conspiracy to break up his family. The babysitter's mother was a friend of Beverly's and she had encouraged her to leave Joseph. Even though the babysitter had nothing to do with the failing marriage, John's hate for the sitter turned into murderous thoughts about killing her. He daydreamed of her laying on the floor dead. And then he dreamt of kneeling next to her and eating her body. What? John was six when his parents divorced. At this time, Beverly moved the family from their home into a rundown apartment and forbade John and Jane from seeing their father. John resented his mother for this. You know, she was extremely controlling and she refused to allow him to be friends with other kids. And she reportedly spanked him until he was 12 years old. She restricted his television viewing and would not allow him to watch shows that she felt were, I don't know, too violent for him. Meanwhile, her son was sitting around thinking about killing people and then eating their bodies. Yikes! Talk about rebellious. John was small in stature and due to their living conditions and his physical appearance, John was often the target of bullies during his years in school. He joined the Cub Scouts to avoid the feeling of isolation he felt. Although he participated in all scouting activities and wore his uniform to school, just like the other boys, he never felt like he was part of the in crowd and still felt like an outcast. He had good grades, but one teacher in particular wrote in his report card, quote, does not play well with other children, end quote. In 1974, his mother moved the family from Massachusetts to Portland, Maine, where they shared a two-story house with another family. John attended elementary school a few blocks from their house. And during elementary school, his favorite teacher was a man named Mr. Bradbury. Well, one day during class, Mr. Bradbury had an experiment that he wanted the kids to test out. 
he had an old crank telephone and he used it to teach the students about electricity. So five students would hold hands. The one closest to the phone cranked it and the one farthest from the phone held a light bulb. He warned the other students, stay back because if you touch one of these students while we're doing this experiment, you will act as a ground and the student in line would get shocked. One of the boys in line was a popular boy by the name of Butch. John hated him and touched his elbow during the experiment, causing Butch to yell out in pain. You see, Butch often bullied John. He cornered him on the playground one day and asked him a question. Are you gay? And John was a little bit confused. He thought gay meant happy or jolly. So he said, yes, I'm gay. Butch made sure the story got around to the whole school, telling everyone that John was a homosexual. That rumor would haunt John through junior high and into Chevrolet High School and making him an even larger target for bullies. John had continued in scouting throughout his time in school. And when he was in the Boy Scouts, he achieved Eagle Scout by the time he was 17. Now, did you know that only 4% of all Boy Scouts reach that honor? That's amazing. But no matter what he did to excel, people just didn't notice him or they preferred to gossip about him instead. John actually only went on one real date in high school, prom. But taking a girl to prom was more of a convenience than romance, and he didn't even try to kiss her goodnight. Meanwhile, throughout his school years, he always had homicidal and cannibalistic thoughts And while he kept his dark passenger at bay for most of his life, did anyone catch that Dexter reference? (laughs) Well, he couldn't contain it any longer. This is just a synopsis of the things that John did before he even graduated from high school. On a cold winter day while outside, there was an eight-year-old boy who was on a walk. His name was Chris Day. John followed behind him and called out for the boy to wait up. Psst, come here. Huh? The boy thought. But he stopped, allowing John to catch up. John asked Chris how old he was, and after he answered, John struck. He grabbed the boy's throat, pinning him up against the building, and Chris struggled, but John tightened his grip, cutting off his air. Panicking, Chris flailed his arms around, trying to escape the terror of being strangled and not having any air. And suddenly, he got lucky. He broke free and ran away as fast as he could, trying not to slip on the ice that was on the street because he knew If he fell, it would all be over. John watched him run away and he could have easily caught him, but he didn't pursue. He felt, though, this like euphoria from being in control. For once in his life, he felt like he was in control. It was something that he'd rarely felt. And in that moment, he wanted more of it. John's next victim was Sarah Canty. She was nine years old and playing with the football outside her home. As she played, she dropped the ball and bent to pick it up. And just as she bent over, John was riding a bicycle past her. He reached out and stabbed her in the back with a pencil. Now, Sarah ran into the house hysterical and explained what happened. The police were soon called and she was able to give the police a good description of the young man and the bicycle. But they could never locate the pencil stabber. Even though the pencil was left behind, there were no witnesses and no fingerprints on the pencil. About a month later, John was on his way home from school and he noticed a little girl around the same age as Chris Day. He called out to her in the same way that he did with Chris. And the girl stopped and turned. Now John told her, hey, come here, I want to talk to you. And she innocently asked him if he was going to take her home. She was unafraid. And for some reason, this made John uneasy. She then said, I have a doctor's appointment. And John told her, "Okay, go, go, go ahead. And she continued on her way. And John just watched her walk away. He felt like it was good practice for what he really wanted to do. When it comes to vitamins, we all deserve to be a little bit of a skeptic. And if you are, that's a good thing, especially when it comes to vitamins, which is why I choose to take the Ritual Essential for Women 18 Plus Multivitamin. Ritual created a clinically backed multivitamin for women who are 18 and over. Ritual's multivitamin supports brain health, bone health, blood health, and provides antioxidant support. And above all else, Ritual has traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. I've always, or almost always, been a vitamin consumer, but I never liked the taste, chalky and honestly just nasty. 
I often wondered what all those ingredients even meant on the label, but I figured, hey, I needed the vitamins, so I just put up with the horrid taste and the ingredients I couldn't even pronounce. But that is now an issue of the past, ever since I found Ritual. Because Ritual comes packed with nine key nutrients in two capsules per day, so you can take your vitamins and relax knowing that you are in good hands. Another thing is that Ritual is packaged in a minty capsule that will leave you feeling refreshed. I've been using Ritual Essential for Women for two months now and I couldn't be happier. So listen up, no more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash military10 to start Ritual or to add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. On a later date, a 27-year-old teaching student, Vicki Goff, was walking to her class at the University of Maine when she noticed a young man walking toward her along the street. She noted how short and thin he was, but she didn't really feel uneasy about him. They crossed paths without saying anything to each other. And a few moments later, the same young man came up alongside her for a few moments until he sped up and walked ahead of her, then vanished. While the situation was odd, she didn't feel threatened. She just thought it was weird. As she approached the university, she heard footsteps behind her again, and she started to turn around. And at that very moment, a hand clamped down over her nose and mouth. A moment later, she felt oh, a sharp pain as John stabbed her in the side with a knife. She looked up and saw the unemotional face of the young man that had twice passed her on her walk to the class. Now she got to her feet and ran for help. Thankfully, he didn't follow her. Later that night, John lay in bed listening to the news on his radio. He smiled a wicked smile to himself when the announcer mentioned Vicky Goff's attack. Vicky survived the attack but was in serious condition. But John wasn't really worried because it seemed that the police had no leads and the description of the attacker could fit hundreds of young white men. There was no way they'd find him. Or so he thought. Two days later, he was on his way from school when a police car pulled up alongside him. The officer called John over and for the first time, he felt nervous. He asked John for his name and where he lived. And when John answered, the officer thanked him and pulled away. How lucky could he be? Before long, though, John would be back to terrorizing his town again. Two months after he stopped Vicky Goff, John noticed a nine-year-old boy named Michael with him. Michael was walking down the street. Now, John called out to him in the same manner that he had done before. Psst, psst. And then he gestured for him to come over. Now, Michael hesitated for a moment, but then approached. John quizzed him, how old are you and where do you live? John then told Michael to look away. When the kid did, John pulled an X-Acto knife from his pocket and slashed Michael's throat. What? Michael likely didn't even know what happened to him, but he felt the pain and instinct kicked in as he ran away as fast as he could, screaming and holding his bleeding throat. His wound was two inches long but it would take 12 stitches to close the gash. Michael's doctors would later say the gash was extremely close to his jugular vein and could have easily been fatal. Michael was lucky to be alive. All the attacks so far were within a two mile radius of John's home, yet no one even suspected the teenager. And John had no regrets about what he had done until he heard warnings at his Boy Scout meeting to watch out for the, quote, Oakdale slasher, end quote. And even though most serial killers would, you know, probably feel like pride and getting a cool nickname, the idea had a different effect on John. He realized that the sick fantasies that he played out had actually caused people pain. And for a brief moment, that scared him. He needed to stop attacking people, and he would, for a while at least. Almost two years went by with no unsolved stabbings or slashings in the area. It appeared the Oakdale slasher had gone dormant. During this time, John graduated from high school and then he tried his hand at college. He enrolled at Norwich University in Vermont, but it was short-lived. You know, college just wasn't his thing. And after he left college, his mind was no longer preoccupied and he was back to feeling like he needed a new high. 
And August 1982 would be the perfect time to pick his next victim. August 22nd, to be exact. 11-year-old Ricky Stetson was small for his age. He had this bright red hair and freckles framed his cheeks. He was super cute. He was sweet and innocent. But Ricky was a little spitfire. He was a runner. And so while he was only 11 years old, it wasn't uncommon for him to run three or more miles around the neighborhood after school let out or even as late as after dinner. He had done this many of times. So on this day was no different. It was about 7.45 p.m. when he left his house wearing his favorite gray sweatshirt with red letters spelling out USA on the front. As he was running along Back Cove Trail, his parents and older brother spotted him as they drove by. So they slowed down for a quick chat and then they went home. Ricky continued on his run. And while his family expected him home by 9 p.m., Ricky never returned. Later, six witnesses would say they saw Ricky jogging, noticing his gray sweatsuit with USA on the front and that a young man with dark hair on a 10-speed bicycle was following him. The last time Ricky was seen alive was just before nine. A few minutes later, a witness said they saw a man on a bike speeding away in the opposite direction. The man kept checking over his shoulder as he pedaled. In the morning, less than 12 hours later, Ricky's body was found beneath a pedestrian bridge near a freeway. He had been stabbed in the chest and he had several gashes on his calf. His clothes were partially removed and the investigators noticed that his sweatpants were tied tightly. And it almost looked like the fact that they were tied tightly kept the killer from pulling them all the way down. According to reporting by Catherine Ramsland, the coroner determined Ricky actually died of asphyxiation. He had been strangled and the random cuts on his leg could have been made to disguise bite marks that the killer had left behind. Even though there was little evidence of the killer, the one thing they did have were two imprints of the killer's top teeth. So if they ever found a suspect, it would be easy to pinpoint if he or she was the killer. Later that month, in August of 1982, 19-year-old John Jubert joined the Air Force. While the police in Portland, Maine were trying to find the person responsible for Ricky Stetson's death, John was not even in the state. He was in San Antonio, Texas for basic training, followed by technical training at Biloxi, Mississippi, where he learned to be a radar technician. There, for the first time in his life, John made a friend, a buddy he could spend his off-duty time with. And the men had gone through basic training, technical training, and then they learned they were going to be stationed at the same base after tech school. Their next stop was Offutt Air Force Base in Bellevue, Nebraska. They went through orientation together and even requested to be roommates, and they were put in barracks 400, room 113. At first, everything seemed fine until John's friend started to become kind of distant toward John and within, I don't know, like a month. He acted cold and only spoke to John in short clipped phrases. You know, John tried to ask his friend, like, what's wrong? But the friend never gave an answer. The roommate even went as far as to request a different room in the barracks. John was stumped. What had he done wrong? Eventually, though, John realized the reason his friend wanted to change rooms. It was because some of the other men had noticed that John and his roommate were spending a lot of time together. They thought John and his roommate were gay. And dang, right in that moment, the old wound that Butch from middle school started back in the day, that opened back up. Now, you have to remember, this was the 80s and homosexuality was illegal in the military and people could get kicked out of the military strictly just for being gay. Now, John's roommate was like, nah, man, I can't have those things being said about me. And so instead of just setting the record straight, he instead chose to drop John as a friend in lieu of having to hear those things being said about them. After this fallout, John fell into a deep depression. He had lost his only true friend ever. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a therapist, someone that you could talk to in a judgment free zone? Maybe you have thought about it, but you were scared away by the thought of taking the first step, or maybe you thought therapy wasn't affordable. Try Talkspace. Talkspace. 
By doing virtual therapy, Talkspace has made getting people help easy, accessible, and affordable. Y'all don't know this, but some things in my life recently have really gotten me down. I wasn't quite sure how to get out of the funk. I wasn't sure how to get back up. So I figured I would try therapy because I was sure that it would definitely not make things any worse. And I'm so glad that I tried it. I have found new coping mechanisms to deal with stress and I'm now looking forward to my future. Talkspace makes it easy to find a therapist that you like and it's so convenient to do everything from the comfort of wherever you are because life sometimes gets hectic. Sometimes I take my calls in my office. Sometimes I take my calls in the car. Life is mobile and therapy should be too. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you. And it's typically done within 48 hours. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and much more. And right now, as a listener of this show, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash military murder. To match with a licensed therapist today, visit Talkspace.com slash military murder to get $100 off your first month and to show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash military murder. John then turned his attention to building model planes to help pass the time that used to be filled hanging out with his friend. One day, John slipped and cut his hand with an X-Acto knife while he was working on his hobby, and he had to go to the base hospital to get stitched up. The nurse gave him surgical tape, gauze for a dressing, and a box of plastic gloves to keep the stitches dry in the shower. All the things he'd use in his next killing. After this incident of cutting his hand, John continued to look for more ways to distract himself from his loneliness. And he decided to reach out to the local Boy Scout troop and offer his time as an assistant scoutmaster. He explained to Don Shipman, the scoutmaster, that he was an Eagle Scout and had experience with his troop back in Maine. Mr. Shipman, the dutiful scoutmaster, ran a background check and contacted John's supervisors at Offit. No one had anything negative to say about John, noting that he was new but progressing in his training as expected. Mr. Shipman then called John to offer him the position as assistant scoutmaster, and he invited him to the next scout meeting on Sunday, September 18th, 1983. Danny Joe Eberly was a 13-year-old boy who delivered newspapers for the Omaha World Herald in Bellevue. His parents, Leonard and Judy Eberly, had ties to nearby Offutt Air Force Base. Leonard had served for 20 years in the Air Force, and after retiring, he became a mail carrier. Danny Joe wanted to follow in his father's footsteps, and while only 13 years old, he and his brother picked up a paper route. After saving up his money for a few months, 13-year-old Danny Joe worked hard and was able to buy his pride and joy with his earnings, a bicycle, and he used this bicycle to deliver the papers. Danny Joe was known to be extremely reliable and often turned down hanging out with his friends to ensure his route was covered. According to an article by Catherine Ramsland, on the morning of September 18, 1983, Danny Joe left for his paper route without shoes, which was his favorite way to travel. He picked up his papers at a parking lot nearby and went about delivering newspapers to his customers. He had about 70 newspapers to deliver that Sunday morning. That morning, John Jubert was in his car across the street where he had gone to get something to drink. As he watched, he watched Danny Joe pick up his newspapers and roll them and get ready for his morning deliveries. John then watched him mount his bike and take off for his paper route. Danny Joe only delivered three papers that day before John forced him to go with him at knife point outside the fourth house, leaving Danny Joe's prized bicycle behind. John directed Danny Joe to walk to his car, a tan Chevy Nova, and to lie down right next to it. He then bound Danny Joe's hands behind his back and taped his mouth closed with a piece of surgical tape. Remember, that same surgical tape that he had gotten when he got that cut on his hand. John then picked Danny Joe up, checking the street for traffic. And then he picked him up and placed him in the trunk of his freaking car on a residential freaking road. John, of course, was wearing a pair of those surgical gloves provided to him at the medical center after he cut his hand. 
John then drove four and a half miles to Base Lake Road with Danny Joe in the trunk. He pulled over by an empty field near a chemical plant, and since it was Sunday, they were all alone. He then carried Danny Joe from the road to a ditch where he took the rope off of his hands and ordered him to take off his shirt. John then took the rope off his ankles and pulled Danny Joe's pants off. He then retied his hands and pulled out a knife that he used to force Danny Joe into his car with. All the while, Danny Joe pleaded with John, please don't kill me, please don't kill me. But John raised the knife and stabbed him in the back. Danny Joe continued to plead, please, 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 please don't kill me, telling John that if he just took him to the hospital, he wouldn't tell anyone who did it. But John didn't care. He was ruthless. John stabbed Danny Joe four more times in the back, then turned him and stabbed him four more times in the chest. And then he slashed the back of his neck to ensure Danny Joe was dead. John then turned to his cannibalistic fantasies and bit Danny Joe randomly all over his legs and shoulder. Where he had bitten his leg, John carved a design over the bite to basically disguise it. He then used Danny Joe's clothes to clean the knife and pulled the body farther away from the road to conceal it better in some high weeds. He then nonchalantly pulled the plastic gloves off his hands and he drove to McDonald's for his morning breakfast. After he returned to the barracks, he laid down in his bed and began to masturbate. It had become his habit to look at soft porn true crime magazines and he would gain sexual pleasure from the images of pain and torture in these magazines. Does does this remind anybody of a different serial killer that I covered? Yeah. BTK. He was super into true crime magazines where they showed pictures of people being gagged and bound and in very vulnerable positions. And if you haven't listened to my four part series on that nut job, go back and listen to episodes 21 through 24 because BTK was seriously sick. In any event, John in that moment remembered back to that morning's killings and he could hear Danny Joe pleading for his life. And that memory did much more for him than the magazines ever could. Meanwhile, back at Danny Joe's house, the phone started ringing off the hook. People who had not yet received their morning paper, specifically the Sunrise Edition, they were calling wondering where the hell their paper was. Danny Joe's supervisor called and said he could not locate him on his route. Danny Joe's dad, Len, and his mom, Judy, quickly got dressed and went out to look for him. They followed Danny Joe's paper route, discovering his bike at the fourth house on the route. The bike was propped up against something and his paper bag was laying just a few feet away, held down by a rock so that the papers wouldn't blow away. Danny's brother, who was also a newspaper delivery boy, realized something suspicious had been happening the last few times that he himself was delivering papers. A man had followed him pretty closely in a tan car for a few days in a row. But Danny Joe's brother never bothered to mention it to anyone until now. And with that new information, everyone was on edge. Danny Joe's family immediately went to the police station. And when they got there, they filled out forms and the police advised them to go back home in case Danny Joe called them. The phone rang several times after they got home and they quickly ran to answer the phone, expecting to have some information about their lost boy. But instead, the calls came from pissed off customers on Danny Joe's route looking for their freaking morning paper. Some people were sympathetic, but others were straight, rude, and mean. That evening, John Juber arrived at the Boy Scout meeting that Don Shipman had invited him to. Remember, this was the same day that John was going to be meeting the new Boy Scouts. Can you believe that? Now, the meeting didn't get into scouting business right away, though. The conversation was dominated by the disappearance of Danny Joe Eberly. Halfway through the meeting, Don suggested that they change the subject. And then he was like, hey, guys, this is John, the new assistant scoutmaster. And he explained John was an Eagle Scout. And guess what? He's an airman from Offutt Air Force Base. And John in that moment wondered what the parents of these Boy Scouts would think if they knew that he was Danny Joe's killer. <laughs> 
The next morning, John drove back out to Base Lake Road to look at Danny Joe's body. He went back to his room after going there and again reminisced about the killing, taking sexual pleasure from the memories. At future scout events, John would tell the boys to not go with strangers and ensured every boy had a ride home following the meetings or outings. Don Shipman was so impressed with John, he even introduced him to the mayor of Bellevue. And the mayor shook John's hands and told him that they needed more young men just like him, going on to say that he was an asset to the community. Ugh, yuck, barf. Ah, it just, it just really makes my skin crawl. After Danny Joe's disappearance, a task force was formed consisting of Bellevue police, the sheriff's office, and FBI agents to find Danny Joe. After two days of searching, though, they started to realize that they were probably looking for a body and not a living boy. On the third day, several teams set out on an organized search to find Danny Joe's body. One team was given the area near Base Lake Road. And while they were searching, the chief of police walked through the ditch in their search area. And within 20 minutes, he came across Danny Joe's body, his hands and feet still bound. The task force immediately noted the unusual rope that was used. It was white on the outside with multicolored strands making up the inside. Because the task force knew that killers often revisit the site of their killings, the task force set up surveillance at the site where Danny was found and probably murdered and also in the neighborhood where he was abducted. But John was not that stupid and the surveillance turned up nothing. The task force, who was working closely with the FBI, brought in members of the behavioral unit to come up with a profile of their killer. They thought that Danny Joe's killer was young, white, and inexperienced. The profilers believed the perpetrator must be white because no one ever reported any suspicious activities in these all-white neighborhoods, right? So they would bet everything that they had that the perpetrator was probably white. And the town was desperate for closure. And as reported by the New York Daily News, a local bank offered a $40,000 reward for information. But even with that incentive, nothing came of it. Two and a half months had gone by and John couldn't wait anymore. He had the urge to kill again. He started driving the streets in the morning after getting off night shift looking for his next victim. He stalked both boys and girls. He didn't care. And he kept his rope, tape, and his knife with him. But every time he got close to a potential victim, boom, something interfered and he lost the opportunity to snatch them. But things would change in December. On the morning of Friday, December 2nd, 1983, according to Ramsland, John left the barracks intent on finding a little girl. And since he had been stalking neighborhoods, he knew exactly the little girl he wanted to take. But when he got there, she wasn't at the bus stop. It was then that he noticed a boy walking down the sidewalk alone. Chris Walden, age 12, who lived in Papillon, Nebraska, was getting ready for school that morning. His mom, Sue, told him that he had to change out of his new tennis shoes and into winter boots for his walk to school. Before he left, she said, you got to wear your hat and you're going to wear this one that your grandmother made you. A typical preteen, Chris didn't want to mess up his hair, but he pulled it on as he walked outside. Sue's husband was already at work and he was an officer at the Air Force assigned as a meteorologist to Offutt Air Force Base. And they had just transferred to the base earlier that year. John was waiting on the side of the road for less than five minutes as he was waiting for that little girl. When he saw Chris walking, he got out of his car and approached Chris and asked for directions. Once he got to him, he showed Chris his knife and told him, that he needed to come with him and he wouldn't get hurt. John put his arm around Chris's shoulders as they walked to John's car. They drove out of town and turned onto a dirt road near railroad tracks and stopped. John got out of the car and told Chris to come with him and to bring his things. John followed him down the railroad tracks and into a patch of trees. John told him, take off your clothes. And Chris listened. He took them off and he neatly folded them on top of his backpack. John told him to leave his underwear on and to lie down. And Chris did it. And the whole time he was crying and told John, no, no. But John grabbed him by the throat and forced him down flat on his back, strangling him. 
In a desperate effort to escape, Chris twisted and turned and kind of like finagled his way to roll away. But then John drew his knife and stabbed Chris in the back several times. Then he slit his throat to ensure he was dead. John was so ruthless and used so much pressure in slitting the young boy's throat that he was practically decapitated. When Chris didn't come home from school that afternoon, Sue stopped at the home of one of Chris's friends to see if he knew where Chris was. The boy was confused and told her that he didn't know where Chris was and he didn't actually see him at school that day. You know, it had been 79 days since Danny Joe Eberly vanished and now another boy in the nearby neighborhood had gone missing. The task force reassembled quickly as soon as they got word about Chris And they got Chris's picture out to news stations everywhere and they started to search for him. But sadly, they wouldn't be looking very long because on Monday, December 5th, 1983, three days after Chris disappeared, two hunters drove out to the area where John had taken Chris. One of them went into the bush to retrieve a bird he shot and that's when he discovered Chris's frozen body dressed only in his underwear and nearby he saw the neatly stacked clothes. The two men quickly drove back to town and called the police. Once the police got there and investigated the scene, they noted a star-shaped carving on Chris's chest. One of the agents suggested that it actually kind of looked like a Boy Scout badge. The next day, a witness called into the police department and reported that he had seen two people struggling in a car that morning. She thought it was a couple arguing, but later thought it could have been a man and a young boy. Another witness came forward with the description of a man walking with his arm around a young boy's shoulder that she said she thought was Chris. And it was the same morning that Chris disappeared. Now that they had two back-to-back child killings, the FBI profilers updated their profile of the killer. Ressler viewed the killings as, quote, a killer's anger with himself, end quote, and possibly a denial of his own homosexuality. I believe that Ressler came to this conclusion since both victims were disrobed, but there was no sign of sexual assault. In his book, Whoever Fights Monsters, My 20 Years Tracking Serial Killers for the FBI, Ressler says that he went out on a limb to say that it could possibly be an enlisted man who does mechanical work and is not very intellectual. He reiterated that this person would likely be involved in some occupation dealing with children. And Ressler would be spot on. But catching the killer would still be a month away. The task force decided to tell the media to warn parents, warn parents, warn kids about someone lurking around schools and churches, any place where children might congregate. While after Danny Joe died, they did not believe they had a serial killer on their hands. The disappearance and subsequent murder of a second boy abducted during daylight hours made them suspect they had a brazen killer on their hands that might strike again. So armed with that information, the FBI wanted to warn people to be alert and to report any suspicious activity of people lurking. And this warning would save so many potential future victims of John Jubert. On January 11th, 1984, 20-year-old John got off work at the Air Force Base at 6 a.m. He went home to change his clothes and to grab his kill kit, a rope, tape, and a knife. Early that week, he had taken his car in for some work and he had a loaner car from a dealership. So he took his loaner car to lurk the streets. Barbara Weaver was a preschool teacher and she was at her school bright and early to set up for class. John pulled into the parking lot and circled the building twice. Barbara probably had heard the FBI alert and she had noticed a car circling the building and thinking it looked suspicious, she repeated the license number to herself to memorize it. John got out of the car, walked to the building and knocked on the door. When Barbara answered the door, John asked her for directions. She gave him the directions that he asked for and then he was like, oh, listen, um, can I use your phone inside? She was not an idiot and she lied and she was like, oh yeah, we don't have a phone. She instinctively, though, got the heebie-jeebies from this guy. She just knew this must be the killer the police were looking for. Suddenly, though, John grabbed for the door, telling Barbara to get inside or he was going to kill her. But Barbara ain't no punk. 
she threw the door open and ran past John out into the parking lot and down to a pastor's house nearby. Now, she heard John start to run towards his car, start the car and drive away, thinking actually that he was going to run her over. But John wasn't trying to run her over. However, because he was so scared and he just got in his car and drove back to the Air Force barracks. The pastor's wife heard Barbara open the door. Barbara jetted inside, chanting the license plate number over and over and over again and saying, call the police. The police soon arrived on scene and she gave the license plate number. Armed with the license plate information, the police tracked down the dealer that owned the car. Remember, it was a rental. And they found out it had been loaned out to John Jubert and that he was an airman at the local Air Force base. So they ended up calling John's first sergeant. They met up with him at the gate. They were then taken to the barracks. By this point, though, John was sound asleep, thinking no one would ever come for him. But, you know, he wouldn't be sleeping for long because along arrived John's first sergeants, OSI agents, FBI agents and the police. The OSI agents took John into custody, read him his rights and asked for permission to search his room and his car. And John granted them permission and they began the search. They found a piece of rope in the glove compartment of John's car. And guess what? It was a rare rope, white on the outside and multicolored on the inside. At the police station, they began to question John and he admitted that he was the one who was there with Barbara that morning. But he basically just said that he wanted to rob her because he needed money to pay the dealer for the car repairs. So they interrogated him about the boys murders, Danny, Joe and Chris Walden. And they showed him pictures of the boys asking John if he knew them. Then Lieutenant Jim Sanderson of the Starpy County Sheriff's Department, he spoke to John about his good and his bad side. And talking to him about that seemed to soften John up. At first, John denied any knowledge of their killings. But after hours and hours of questioning, he confessed to killing both boys, blurting out, why did I kill those boys? When asked where he had got the unusual rope, he told the detectives that he got it from Don Singleton, the scoutmaster. He had given him the rope to teach the Boy Scouts how to tie different knots. John Jubert was charged with the murder. At first, he pled not guilty, but then he changed his pleas to guilty. He had various psychiatric evaluations and he was not OK, clearly. He was characterized as having obsessive compulsive disorder, sadistic tendencies and suffered from schizoid personality disorder. But even with that, he was found to not be suffering from any mental defect at the time of his crimes. On October 9th, 1984, he pled guilty and was convicted of the murders of Danny Joe and Chris, and he was sentenced to death. During the same time frame at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia, the FBI used John Jubert's file to teach other police departments and other agencies about criminal profiling. That's the act of taking, you know, like a person's crimes and developing a profile of the killer to help catch the killer before they strike again. In attendance in this particular class was a police officer from Portland, Maine, and he couldn't help but notice, dang, there was some uncanny similarities to the unsolved case of Ricky Stetson and the serial killer being described in this class. He was like, wait, what? Can it be possible? Bite mark comparisons prove that John Jubert was in fact responsible for Ricky Stetson's death in Maine. Can you believe that? What are the odds that some random cop from Maine happened to be at this class teaching about the guy they were actually looking for? Further investigation in Maine also tied the pencil stabbing and slashing of the two other victims to John Jubert. John was extradited to Maine and stood trial for Ricky Stetson's murder. In 1990, six years after his conviction in Nebraska for the murders of Danny, Joe and Chris, John was convicted and sentenced to life in prison for Ricky Stetson's murder. He was then returned to Nebraska where he awaited the death penalty. On July 17, 1966, 33-year-old John Jubert, who had been on death row for 12 years, he died at the Nebraska State Penitentiary in the electric chair. The protocols for electricity in Nebraska call for 2,450 volts of electricity to be administered for eight seconds. 
followed quickly by 480 volts for 22 seconds, followed by a 20 second pause, then a second application of the same pattern of volts as the first round. Long thought to be a cruel and unusual form of death, John's autopsy results were used in arguments against the use of the electric chair. John had a four inch blister on top of his head and smaller blistering on both sides of his head above his ears. Prior to his death, John had claimed he was a changed man. He had even struck up a pen pal relationship with a woman in Ireland who had three young sons herself. John's three murders spanned a year. And in that time frame from August 22nd, 1982 to December 2nd, 1983, he managed to kill a boy in his hometown, join the Air Force and become an assistant scoutmaster with the Boy Scouts near his duty station at Offutt Air Force Base. And let's not forget how he was lauded by the mayor of Bellevue for being such an asset to the community. Ressler wrote in his book, Whoever Fights Monsters, that after John was captured, John actually turned to him and said, he was glad he had been caught because he was certain he would kill again. So what did you guys think? Have you ever heard of this guy? Can you believe that he was actually an active duty member and a serial killer at the same time? If you want to see more pictures of the victims and of the perpetrator in today's case, make sure that you follow me on Instagram, which is where I post most often. You can also join me on the Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash military true crime. If you like what you heard and you want more content, check out the Patreon fan club where for as little as a dollar a month, you can listen usually early and ad free every single week. Check out the different tiers at patreon.com slash military murder. Shout out to this month's newest patrons, Andrew R and Angela L. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions and produced in collaboration with my bootcamp and higher fan club members. Executive producers for this episode are Falcon 13 and Nicole G. The music was created by Tyops. And again, a special thank you and shout out to my girl Myrtle for researching and writing this episode. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of. So remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. Shh, let's work on our podcast.